All right, good evening, Hampstead. Uh, tonight is Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. Uh, calling to order the uh, Hampstead School Board meeting. Uh, Melissa, would you mind taking the roll call? Yes. Carl Hebner? Here. Jason Giard? Here. David Smith? Here. Megan Malcolm? <laughs> Hi, Megan. <laughs> here. Here. Thank you, Megan. And Aaron Pellegrini, I see is absent tonight. Pinkerton student liaison, Shannon Caffell. Here. Thank you. And also seated at the board table is Superintendent of Schools, Bob Thompson, and CFO, Jeff Dowd. All right. Uh, if I can ask everybody to rise to the Pledge of Allegiance and ask our departing school board member to lead us. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Uh, board members, if you would look into your packets, there is a set of minutes to uh, review and approve from January 24th regular meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from January 24th, 2023, regular meeting. All right. Looking I'll second that. All right. Any uh, discussion? All approved. All right. right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Melissa, are there any public comments? No, we have no public comments tonight. I think they're all here for the main event. All right. We're looking uh -huh. forward to it. All right, we've got a lot of stuff to talk through, uh, but first, our uh, school highlights with Dr. Cheney. All right, uh, well, thank you for having me tonight. It's nice to see everybody here. Um, Things at Hampstead Central School are going well. One thing I did want to mention to the board is that we are currently at policy in all of our second grade classrooms. We had that conversation at the beginning of the school year and there was a policy waiver put in at that time, but we're right at policy. So any future second graders will um, mean that we'll have to use that policy waiver to find space for them in our school. Um, but our enrollment right now is a, holding steady at about 450 students as we get the halfway point of the school year. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some coding work that our technology teacher, Mrs. Garside, is doing in conjunction with Mrs. Wise Carver, our Ventures students, uh, our Ventures teacher, excuse me. Um, students from kindergarten through fourth grade have been learning to code, and I won't steal their thunder, but you'll learn a lot more about that tonight with some of your special guests. An update on kindergarten enrollment for 23-24. We're starting to hear from some families who are interested. We've heard from about 52 families, which is quite a lot at this point in the school year. And tomorrow evening, I'll be hosting a parent night for incoming kindergarten families to learn more about our programs, see the school in the classrooms, start filling out their enrollment forms, and have all their questions answered. So anybody with a kindergarten age student, which is a five-year-old before September 30th of this year, is encouraged to attend. As part of our strategic plan, we have been working on universal design for learning this year. And one of the activities that we have undertaken is working on something called instructional rounds in each of our grade levels. And our grade level teachers have had an opportunity to observe each other in practice and look for evidence of ways that they're incorporating expert learning into their classroom. Um, most of our teams have completed that work within the last couple of weeks and the feedback has been really positive. Teachers have enjoyed seeing each other's practice and have talked about what a great opportunity it was for professional development. 
Uh, the month of February is a great time for us to celebrate kindness and friendship at HCS. Last week with Valentine's Day, the kids were so excited to share all the nice things that they could do and ways that they can be kind to others. Mrs. Laz's class even came up with 100 different ways to show kindness in our hallways, which was lovely to see and read. We celebrated our 100th day of school back on February 9th. This is a massive milestone for young learners when a three digit number is a really big deal when you're in kindergarten and first grade. Um, hopefully you've seen some of the pictures that we've posted on the website and on social media. Lots of kids dressed up as if they were 100 years old or they did writing prompts about being 100 years old and different STEM challenges of stacking and um, developing things with 100 different pieces in them. This month in PE, our students will participate in a jump roping unit. We had a wonderful kickoff by the American Heart Association and the Hoppin' Hawks from Londonderry came to dazzle our students with lots of tricks that they've learned. And our students in third and fourth grade can do some fundraising for the American Heart Association, but all students will practice their jump roping skills and learn some of those tricks that they saw as well. I wanted to mention another opportunity that our venture students are participating in, which is the NASA Snow Globe event. Um, students have been collecting data from the various winter storms. They're looking at precipitation, snowpack, and new snowfall. And their data is actually shared with NASA in partnership with other schools in this area. And so students have had an opportunity to hear from scientists about their project and even ask questions via Zoom. Uh, two last things for you, you know, a big thank you to our folks who are supporting our club system this year. Mr. Torelli and Mrs. Poulin um, ran a fun and successful ski club this winter. About 40 students joined them for five weeks of skiing up at McIntyre. And Ms. Dustin has facilitated two rounds of our dance club. And stay tuned after February break, we'll have a few more clubs for you. And finally this evening, I'm proud to let you know that we have two New Hampshire Teacher of the Year nominations from the Hampstead Central School. I wanna give a congratulations to Mrs. Stark and Mrs. Burkett on the honor of being nominated. It is a lengthy, significant process and they're deciding if they're going to engage in it, but it's an honor to just be nominated. Are there any questions about HCS? No, great update, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have our Pinkerton uh, liaison, Shannon. All right. It's been a rough week for Pinkerton. We're all mourning the loss of our classmate, and we are most definitely ready for break. But lots of sports things going on. The JV and varsity cheer teams won their meets these past few weekends. Gymnastics also won their states. Women's swim placed second, which is the best in Pinkerton history. And Jackson Marshall became the fifth person to reach the 1,000 point mark in basketball. And all basketball teams absolutely crushed Trinity this past week. <laughs> that, that was awesome, just saying. At the swim meet, three students set new school records. Student council put on an amazing winter dance last Saturday with um, a Northern Lights theme. And the class of 2024 hosted Millie Vanilli, the lip sync battle and congrats to the senior class for taking home the win. Last month, 12 student council students and six National Honor Society students attended the LEAD Sparks Conference in Washington, DC. And the Derry Police Department brought comfort dogs to school this past Friday. They were absolutely adorable. That's all I have for you tonight. Any questions? No. No, you're looking forward to the break and uh, very sorry to hear about the tragedy, so yeah. I've heard that uh, Dr. Powers has done a lot to get the students uh, a place for, you know, to talk and listen, so. Yeah, he's been great. Great. And uh, congrats on crushing Trinity. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you, Shannon. All right, so we're going to move on to current business and probably the highlight of the night. Uh, we're going to turn this over to Heather Mayu and Sarah Wisecarver to bring on the steam. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce our amazing students to you who will share about this year's STEAM Family Night. 
tonight's presentation will be led by our eighth graders, Chris Lavoie and Mo Smith. Thank you for allowing us to share and show what STEAM Family Night is all about. This Thursday, February 23rd, our doors here at HMS will open. At 5.30, and we will invite you to come and play our student-created giving games. These giving games will be held in the gym and will consist of student-created cardboard arcade and a mini golf course. We created these games with the purpose of hosting an event that we could promote the act of giving. With this being said, we will be asking for donations of non-perishable goods or money as a giving fee upon entry. All benefits will go to our own saltbox pantry located here on the campus. First graders Will and Jack will now demonstrate how their claw machine is working for the Giving Games. Thank you to Will and Jack. Um, beginning at 6 p.m., our guests will be invited to visit the robotics expedition in the CAF. PA Robotics will be sharing a demonstration from their robotics competition this year. And students of Hampstead Middle School will also be showing their robotics talents using oozbots and tie rovers. Here is Ryle and Gavin, who, two HTS fourth graders, who will demonstrate and speak about tie rovers. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this boy here is Gavin and I'm Rai, and tonight we are presenting these extraordinary rovers. If you can give us your wanted attention, we will talk and program the rovers. By the way, thank you for joining us here tonight, now let's get into it. We need, we, I mean, we learned how to code these rovers in technology class with Mrs. Garside and Mrs. Weiss Carver, so if you can say thank you to them, they will appreciate it a lot. The calculators on the rover's back are what we use to co code the rovers to move, for to move forward, left, right, or even backwards. To make the rover go, you input the Python and then select what you would like the rover to do. Control R will run the code. We are very grateful for your attention and for you being here. We wish you have a fabulous night. We can't wait to see you at STEAM Family Night and hope the rest of the school board meeting goes well. So they'd like to demonstrate just very quickly how the rover works.
what they're doing for those at home is they're typing the code into the calculator right now. So they're programming what they will have the rover do to move. There will be 10 of these available at Family Steam Night. There it goes. <laughs> nice job, Ryan Gavin. So there will be 10 of these available for, at Family Steam Night for all the students to use. Thank you, Ryan Gavin. Beginning at 6.30, students will be facilitating STEAM challenges that they have created based on children's literature and within the theme of using technology to acknowledge the needs of others. We have more than 10 challenges to choose from, including can you create a bridge to help the wind-up chick safely cross a body of water based on the book Crossings, Extraordinary Structures, Structures for Extraordinary Animals. Another challenge based on the book Hurricane by John Rocco is can you design a boat dock that can survive a hurricane? Our hope is that participants will have time to take part in two challenges from 6.30 until 7.30 p.m. Now, fourth grade student Livy Frazzese will present one of our STEAM challenges. Hi, my name is Livy, and this is my project that I've been working on with a group. It's to stop erosion. So what you do is you pour water onto the top and kids have to put sponges in the right places or wherever they want really and pour water into it to try to make water not go into the house because water can destroy houses so they try to put the sponges in the right places to make the water not destroy the so the sponges serve as the trees, and people, kids will be putting pipe cleaners and little paper leaves on the trees to try to make them look like trees and put them somewhere they think that would help stop the water flow. This is my project, um, me and another student in Ventures we're working on. It's about um, filtering water because in Africa they don't have clean water. So what you would do is you would take the cup and you would try to take different filters and figure out if you filtered the water or if you didn't. Thank you to Livy for Susie and Gavin. Um, we would like to invite all, all of you to our community. Uh, oh my God. We would like to inv invite each of you <laughs> and all our community members to join us on Thursday beginning at 5.30 here at HMS Middle School. This is a fun event for all ages. We would, like, we would ask that there be no child drop-offs. Bring the whole family, the more the merrier. There will also be a raffle. All HMS and HCS students will be able to fill out a ticket with their name and homeroom or advisor upon entering STEAM Family Night. And we will be put, pulling one name from each school to win two admissions tickets to see the SEE Science Center. <laughs> Again, we thank you for your time and attention, and we hope to see you at STEAM Family Night on Thursday, February 23rd. If we have to postpone due to weather, our snow date is the thir Thursday after vacation, March 9th. Thank you. <laughs> oh, now the HCS students will be handing out invitations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lou. Thank you. So that was pretty amazing, really. Um, first and foremost, I agree with the students. Thank you, Ms. Mayu, Ms. Weiskaver, and everybody else involved with this. Um, it's pretty amazing just to see a small sample of what we're going to see on Thursday or on March 9th in case of the weather. Um, 
board members, do you have any questions? Thank you all for coming out. It was a lot of fun. Okay. All right. Next up, we're, uh, and we won't keep you here if you, unless you want to really listen to us. <laughs> so we'll give you a few minutes to break if you would yeah. like. Uh, we know it's late for some children. Yep. You can use that as an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. When I was a kid, I was happy to have like a Commodore 64. Now, you know, programming robots, it's awesome. With a calculator. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. As uh, everybody's exiting now, um, we are going to continue with the agenda. Uh, next up is to talk about the HCS scheduling task force, uh, an update by Dr. Cheney. Well, that's going to be a real tough act to follow tonight. <laughs> um, I don't have any props or anything super fun to tell. Well, no, this is great. Um, so, all right, we're going to talk about scheduling now. Um, and again, as part of the strategic plan, we developed a, uh, excuse me, a scheduling task force to really take a look at our master schedule and look for opportunities to continue to develop it and um, really make it a dynamic schedule that's in the best interest of our students. Over the course of this year so far, the team has met 12 times to try to look at our existing schedule, think about what we're really trying to achieve, and to develop that improvement in, in real time. Um, so as I mentioned, we did meet as part of the strategic plan, and when we first met, we engaged in some goal setting and visioning. You know, what were we trying to achieve? What was our ideal to come out of a reimagine of our schedule and some of the goals that the task force developed were uh, things like developing a really comprehensive educational program for the students at HCS, making sure that we allow time for all students to participate in enrichment opportunities such as you know music, chorus, Spanish, um, social emotional learning and that we also make sure that there's enough time during the school day that students um, are able to develop to their full academic potential as well. And so some of the barriers that we've noted were things like when we have grade levels of five, which is quickly becoming our norm, with our current day, it's hard for all five teachers to have common planning time. And part of that is due to time constraints, and another part is due to some space restraints. I can only run one PE, for example, at a time during the middle portion of our day. Um, another barrier is that when we have students who have many different services, they also require many different interventions. And we all have the same six and a half hours in our day, so trying to make all these different puzzle pieces fit um, for a variety of needs. And also the team talked about the inequities between the half-day K program and the full-day K program and what students have opportunities for. So we um, went in thinking about those things, but also this future that we could imagine. Um, and so some of the limitations that we have on us here are that we're finding that young students are coming to school with a different skill set than children just even since the beginning of my career, you know, five, ten years ago. I wish I had only been in education that long, but, um, you know, and some of that is a little bit of pandemic impact, but some of that is just the nature of the way that the world is changing and developing in this digital landscape. And another limitation, as I just mentioned, is, is the space issues. We can only run one PE during half the day because half of the area is used for the cafeteria. There are space constraints on intervention spaces and places that we can work with kids, which are a barrier to the schedule. So some of the things that the team is doing is they're really looking at considering the frequency and duration of some of the extra enrichment opportunities. One of the things that's great about Hampstead is that we don't just have the PE, the music, the, you know, the art, the basics, but we've gone above and beyond 
to develop an integrated arts environment and include things like chorus, Spanish. We make sure every kid has a library visit during the week, um, some social emotional learning, but that's minutes out of a day to work with, um, to work in your core content areas as well. And the team is looking for ways to increase flexibility in the schedule, because as fixed as a schedule is, we do still need some of that flexibility for students to take advantage of multiple things. And so the team is really wrestling with, they've, they've used this great analogy that I really appreciate, it's, it's like baking a cake. And so what ingredients are we putting into this schedule or this cake of sorts, and what does our outcome and our product look like? So that's where we are. I'm hoping that we can wrap this up and have a solid draft. By the end of um, March, I almost said February, <laughs> uh, by the end of March, you know, to bring forward so that way um, the superintendent and I can wrestle with that. What questions, thoughts, feedback do you have? Cool. Megan, any questions? I don't have any questions. I like the analogy of the cake. You know, yeah. I think Hampstead's cake is different than others. It is. I, I appreciate what we bring, you know, the, the extracurriculars of sorts, even if it's just flavored in. So I appreciate that that's all there. Yeah. Uh, so I, pre I appreciate that analogy for sure. But that's good. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chain. Thank you. All right. Next, we've got a, a technology update from Director uh, Joseph Dion. Good evening, Hampstead School Board. I have a technology update for you. We're gonna start with the category of staffing. We have a new network administrator named Cesar Hilton. Uh, he is a valuable asset to our team and he's been with us since early November um, 2022. He's actually recording and live streaming um, this broadcast as we speak. We also have an assistant position at HCS, Hampstead Central School, that is still open. Once this position is filled, our department will be sufficiently staffed as it was back in 2018, which consists of a technology director, two network administrators, and an assistant for tier one support. My next category is website development. Uh, the company Aptigy won our RFP bid process that we did. Um, we are forming a committee that will meet weekly to review and discuss the design templates submitted by Aptigy. We will be looking for feedback on the overall design and layout. We also want to ensure the website is user friendly, easy to navigate, um, so we will be looking for input on the user experience as well. Currently, we are also looking to have a community member join our committee. So if you're a member of the uh, community and you wish to be um, on our committee, please reach out to us. The timeline for this project, the design phase um, right now, which is what we're in, is February and March. The development and content migration is going to take place in April. Um, the user training uh, for this website, for the uh, interface, is also going to take place in April. And we're hoping to go live with this project um, on or near May 15th. Next topic is current state of technology. We are keeping up with preventative maintenance in our department. Um, we are going to be utilizing winter break to take care of firmware updates and all applicable network appliances um, in the district. Looking to the future, we have a technology presentation. The name of this presentation is Technology Tips, Tricks, uh, and a Security Awareness. Michael Shaw and I will be presenting this um, Tuesday, March 7th as part of the PD, PD for the staff. This presentation will be taking place in the cafeteria at the Hampstead Middle School. We're also uh, anticipating and looking forward to the NHSAS statewide testing system. We're going to be starting this test um, starting on May 15th. Um, our department plays a big role in these tests. Uh, we're going to be communicating with parents and homeroom teachers to have students with any device issues that might hinder this test um, to bring those devices to the Chromebook office if they are a Hampstead Middle School student or fill out a um, ticket at Hampstead Central School so we can come down and take a look at those devices. Their homeroom, homeroom teachers fill out those tickets. We're also going to be doing a projector update this summer, um, which will include removing old devices and mounting new devices. We currently are slating for 13 projector replacements at middle school and eight projector replacements at central school. Also part of the summer tasks that we have will be a Chromebook um, inventory. Um, this um, involves provisioning new Chromebooks for the fifth grade and new Chromebooks for the first grade. 
kindergarten students at Hampstead Central School um, have a uh, grade-wide touchscreen Chromebook. Every student has this. In first grade, students will get a new device that carries with them through the end of fourth grade. Fifth grade students get a new device every year, and that device follows them through their graduation in eighth grade. We will also be taking inventory and inspecting all devices in the district um, for Chromebooks for students. So if there are any issues during the summer, um, the idea is that the students will start the year with a clean, fresh device, um, perfectly working. We also have a firewall gateway project um, slated for the summer. Um, this is gonna be over at Hampstead Central School. Um, we participated in a RFP, which is actually still out right now. Uh, it will be um, ending on March 6th. The installation and configuration is slated for early to mid-July this summer. Um, I also want to note on this project that we will be participating in E-rate funding. Hampstead's E-rate discount for 22-23 is 40% and then we'll also be 40% for the year of 2023-2024. And that is what I have for an update. Do you have any questions for me? What's the lifespan for the projectors? Like how, on average, how long do they last? Roughly. That's a good question. Um, I would say anywhere between seven to 10 years, but um, the bulbs will go on them, so we do replace the bulbs. But um, one of the main purpose for these um, this project that we're doing is the fact that any old projector that has an analog interface like a VGA, like the old connection, okay. um, we want to update that to HDMI. The idea is um, anyone with a device that has HDMI can go into any classroom and not have a hassle. As it stands right now, um, some um, people have dongles to adapt the conversion between VGA and HDMI for that interface, and it's, um, it's just uh, a task that we don't want to um, have anyone to do. We just want to have anyone be able to go into any classroom that has a projector, um, connect up, and present. That so. makes sense. Thank you. Just a question about the projectors. I think we usually ask this question whenever we talk projectors. Why uh, projectors do not go towards the flat screens? Um, Every classroom already has a projector and the teachers are trained on them. So um, they are typically, uh, the projectors that we're looking at are cheaper um, than the flat screens. So it's a, it's a cost thing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, next one up uh, is uh, talking about the 2023 Summer Learning Academy with Nicole. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that awesome student presentation. Um, our plans for Summer Learning Academy are uh, well underway. We've met several times. And this year, we're excited because we're going to be integrating experiences from Summer Learning Academy with our service delivery model for extended school year. Um, so what this will allow us to do is be able to offer all of our students together a more robust model. So it'll be a 16-day model over the summer, Monday through Thursday. Um, it will take place over the course of four weeks from July 10th through August 3rd. Um, each week will have unique enrichment themes that will kind of complement the service delivery. So there's a lot of ways that we can achieve the service deliveries required for special ed. Um, and we're, gonna, we're really looking forward, Jess and I have been working closely together to kind of come up with some more creative ways to do that. Um, families will be able to sign up for a specific week or any combination of weeks. Of course, it will continue to be free again this year, paid for with our federal grant funds. Um, it'll come from ESSER 3. And we have already been in talks with our uh, Renaissance Kids point of contact, Chris Rodriguez. Field to Fork Farm is available to us, so we're really excited about doing some therapeutic off-site intervention work there um, with the older kids. and. Uh, as well as the community garden and camp invention. Thanks. And and of course, our staff um, last year put together some unbelievable um, offerings for art and art around town. We had music on site here. So I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what other kind of creative things we can fill in. Um, and currently our ESY coordinator is surveying the staff regarding their availability to work in the summer. So one of the challenges is, of course, staffing. But I'm excited about this model because I think people will be able to plug in what they can do, right. not having to do 16 days total. They could do just four and um, look at our kind of creative programming options. 
So. This is awesome. It's good to get yeah, ahead of it like this. Oh, thank you. And I feel like we're way ahead right. of schedule this year, so I'm excited about that too. Right. Questions? When, do you, when would you foresee a schedule for parents? Well, I know people tend to book summer camps in April, so my goal would be to get it out to them as soon as possible. But if they want to earmark, those weeks will be the weeks. That won't be changing. It's just a matter of what offerings each week will entail. Um, so I would say I would err on the cautious side, maybe May. Okay. Um, yeah. But they're will signing be. up for camps right now. Just to give you a head. It gets <laughs> earlier and earlier. It's crazy. Every it's, year. It is. It's crazy. It backs it up. Um, our, as soon as we know and lock in our staff yeah. for certain offerings, then we can kind of draft our schedule. We have, um, we know Renaissance Kids is available the first three weeks, so, but I don't want to get too ahead with any one component. Would it make sense to at least get some sort of notification out saying, hey, we're planning it. Here's sure. the weeks to plan. Yep. We don't know exact, but just so they can start to think about it. I, I can certainly do that. All right. And it would, it would actually be helpful for us to gauge interest too. If we knew like how many first graders versus how many seventh graders, that would help us plan activities. Yep. All right, thank you. This but we're great. definitely thinking of Field to Fork Farm offsite for the older kids and kind of keeping it a little bit special and different for them. Right. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, next, uh, talk about uh, we did have the sending school districts uh, winter meeting um, at Pinkerton myself and mr. Thompson uh, attended uh, a couple weeks ago now um, good meeting there was a couple of things that we discussed um, I'd say the two main topics that I took away was uh, the building that they're going to be um, uh, starting later this year uh, we'll get the exact numbers for the cost and the impact to tuition in the f in the future. I forget the exact percent, but I think it was around that two percent was what um, it would cost every town, ish, depending on you know if it, you know, you have more students going next year versus not. Um, so we'll get the exact numbers in the coming uh, in the coming few months. Um, the bigger topic that was an interesting one that went on for a while. We had a few brainstorming sessions, et cetera. Was the, the thought about um, the start time of Pinkerton changing. So not saying it is changing. What they're gonna do is they've been doing some studies. They've been working with some, uh, with a doctor. Um, I wanna say it was a neurologist, neurologist uh, but, and other um, members of Pinkerton to look at, does it make sense to even entertain discussions with the sending towns? And the answer overwhelmingly was yes. It does make sense to at least talk about this. So after you know, probably a good hour and a half discussion amongst the school board members are there and the educators are there, uh, they decided that there will be a committee started. They're gonna be looking for one representative from the towns to take part and to bring information back to the towns, garner more in interest in discussions, you know, understand the impact, understand what it would take if we decided to change start times. Uh, and really the reason why is it's, you know, there's this, I'd say it's been pretty proven um, that you know kids getting more sleep into the morning makes more sense as a high schooler. Um, we also something I, f I found out we are the Pinkerton is this high school that starts the earliest in all of New Hampshire. Uh, most schools, high schools start in around that 8:30 time frame, um, where we start just after seven o'clock. So, and as you can imagine, as those parents that have known that have sent their kids, our kids are getting up anywhere five five thirty getting on a bus around six to get there by seven. So again, this is all just talk right now to understand what could happen, what could not happen, what are the constraints, what would we have to do to um, change. Um, I wouldn't imagine that they would be making a change for some time, even if we decided, you know, as a committee and as the school systems, uh, everybody has to sign off on this. But long story short, they are gonna be looking for one representative uh, from Hampstead to, uh, to uh, partake in that committee. Um, my suggestion on that is to have Mr. Thompson uh, do that since they'll be meeting all the hours of the day at times and with his schedule probably more flexible than the rest of ours. Uh, but open to any questions, dialogue about this or thoughts about somebody you're representing. You said most, schools start, most high schools started at 8.30, I think you meant 7.30, right? Um, on the average, most of them were starting between 8 and 8.30 throughout the state. 
they, they had a listing, uh, and I don't have it with me, but they had a listing of the high schools. There were some starting in the 7.30 to 8 o'clock time frame, um, but we're definitely on the Oh, yeah, no, left, it's, it's uh, outlier. Yeah, Pinkerton's always been super early. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. But there were some high schools that are starting at like 9, 9.05, 9, 9.10. Not many, but mm -hmm. they're the outlier on the other side. Yeah. So they're just looking to um, have the dialogue and understand what constraints we have. You know, transportation, parents, after school care, after school activities, all of this was talked about um, as just uh, that would, they would bring to the committee. So, there, you know, what questions do we have that would have to be answered? What things would we have to have true to make it happen? Um, and we know that there'd be a lot of conflicts here with the, our school buses that have to get kids at Central and Middle School. Uh, so there's definitely um, a lot more discussion that we had by this. Yeah, the biggest discussion that I've seen that comes up is always child care, is that having the older kids home sooner for the younger kids is generally the, the biggest concern that comes up whenever somebody talks about changing start times. Yep. But yeah, it is, it's better, it, the way they're biologically, it's better for the younger kids actually to be in earlier and the older kids to go in later. Correct. Um, but yeah, it would be a significant change. Yep. So uh, I believe the committee is gonna start in the next few weeks. Uh, so that's why I bring it up now and seeing if anybody has any objection to having Mr. Thompson represent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Thompson and I did talk about this and he, uh, okay. <laughs> he had said that he would be uh, welcoming and he actually asked to be part of this. Since okay. it, they will have, you know, they will do morning meetings. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of coordination between the towns. So having somebody as flexible, uh, you know. Absolutely. <clears throat> You know, it's also important that as this process unfolds that uh, we're collecting uh, feedback from all of our community stakeholders, our parents, um, our teachers, our students, um, to make sure that um, any information that I'm able to bring to the committee is really a collective of all of the different voices in the community. So, all right. So we look forward to hearing more from Mr. Thompson about that in the future. Uh, Ms. Thompson, anything else you'd bring back from the uh, from the winter meeting? Anything else we th that was discussed worth noting? No, I think largely that was it. And again, there was some talk about um, you know an upcoming construction project, which would um, make enhancements um, largely to their special education spaces. Yep. Um, there was the talk about start time. Uh, they have a professional development opportunity over the summer for uh, teachers uh, that they're offering the sending schools. Um, all in all, it's a, it's a really great meeting because, you know, you get the opportunity to interface with not only the Board of Trustees, but also, um, you know, school board members and the superintendents from the other communities. And, and for me personally, having been a graduate of Pinkerton, every time I go, I get to sit with, uh, with alumni and uh, former teachers, and it's just, it's just a really nice experience. I really enjoy it. Yep. Agreed. What's uh, HB 6, 1661? It's on us. I believe. I looked it up and it had something to do with CTE. It but. is, yeah. So uh, essentially what they, um, there was a bill that was passed uh, that requires uh, coordination between all of the um, CTE programs um, that allows for no greater than 10 conflicts between their master schedules in the course of a year. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think we've now, talked about this it, before. Um, the, the issue is, is that um, it is difficult to achieve and it takes a tremendous amount of coordination. Um, so, you know, districts are working through uh, how to comply uh, with, the, with the law. Do we only send to Pinkerton for CTE or do we go to any other districts? It is my understanding that we largely send just to Pinkerton. Okay. Just yeah, Pinkerton. I think Pinkerton is everything, but yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. So overall, great uh, update from uh, uh, Dr. Nevius as well as uh, Dr. Powers on this. So a lot of good information shared and uh, more information has been shared since. Um, just talking about, um, you know, again, the building, projected um, student uh, population and other information. So definitely a good night to hear some good information from them. All right. Let's see. Next up is the deliberative session recap. So with this, um, again, I think the recap here to communicate to everybody is it was a good uh, overall deliberative, uh, some good discussions, 
had a couple of members of the public get up uh, to support uh, the, the building uh, renovation project. Um, to remind everybody that since that deliberative session that was on uh, February 7th, the next big date is March 14th, which is the district voting. That'll be here from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the middle school. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to anything above that for the deliberative, but I think it was a pretty straightforward uh, discussion. So we're going to move on and get into the HCS uh, renovation plan. So this is just uh, on the agenda, of course, just to remind everybody we've done pretty much of what we can to date. We've got it um, on the ballot for the public to uh, vote as they wish based on the information. What we would ask is if anybody has any questions about the plan, no matter how big or how small, please get a hold of Mr. Thompson or any of the school board members here. Uh, we will certainly provide information. Um, what's left that we're doing uh, just today Mr. Thompson and I went around to businesses to drop off information um, on the warrant about what is included in the plan as well as the plan drawing. So you'll start to see some of those posted in the windows of local businesses. Uh, so again, if you see those and you have more questions, please reach out. Um, I know that we are interested in discussing uh, sending a second postcard so it'd be just about the same as the first one. Um, some of the school board members, we've talked about sending a second solicitation out there just to uh, be closer to the vote. So we sent one at the beginning of February. We're talking about sending a second one at the you know, beginning-ish of March, just before the vote that's on the 14th, uh, to remind people how close it is to the vote and uh, have it fresh in their mind after school vacations and or any other ongoing activities. Uh, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about that, any suggestions, thoughts of not reasons not to do it? No, nope, no reasons not to do it. Nope. All right. So I'd like to make a motion to send out a second postcard with a not to exceed of $2,000 for mailing to all residents uh, prior to the March 14th vote. Second. All right, any discussion? All approved? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, just, it is sitting, you know, the plans are right behind us uh, for those that have not seen this before, but this is what you'll see posted around the community and at different windows of businesses and uh, having these stacked places so, so they can be handed out. Um, it was, you know, interesting today during our, our field trip of such to drop off these. We had some interactions with uh, community members, which I think we had some good discussions. And, you know, kind of talked about the three different priorities. And what it came down to is that, you know, this plan is about space. And just the space that we need for security, the space that we need for special education, and the space that we need for student learning. Um, I don't know, Mr. Thompson, anything you take away from today's discussions? Anything you bring up to the public, what we heard or what we saw? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting um, to go around. So first of all, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, we went to, I think, I think 15 different restaurants and places to uh, hang up the posters, and every single one of them uh, was, was willing to do that. So that, that's great, and we're going to continue to do that. I think, um, you know, there's this kind of spectrum of um, sort of thought and feeling on the project, some that see this... Um, you know, are, are concerned about their pocketbook and um, their property taxes, and we've done everything that we can uh, to try to bring this project in at a price that we believe the uh, community can afford, also looking at grant opportunities. And then I think there are other folks that are, they are very enthusiastic. They feel that this is our year, that a lot of thought has gone into this design, a tremendous amount of input from the community, from, the, from our building committee, where not only are their parents on there, but we actually put people on the building committee who, um, you know, were the naysayers because we wanted their input and we wanted to be able to develop a plan that was thoughtful. Uh, and then I think there's people that are concerned that um, uh, there's a large number of people in this community that support this project. The concern is they don't all get out to vote. 
And I think uh, a lot of our efforts uh, need to go into making sure people have all the information they need about the project and then encouraging them to come out and uh, engage in the democratic process. And so I think some of our conversations today, and we, it was a whirlwind, we're flying around the town, <laughs> but even the brief conversations we had uh, today, I think are reflective in, in, in those thoughts. Yeah. You know, I was gonna ask some detailed questions tonight, but I think for me it's more, you know, for those people watching that are wondering what can they do, reach out to your school board members, reach out to your neighbors, uh, Remind them to vote. If you have questions, ask us. You know, being pretty clear, transparent that this is a prioritized plan, uh, pretty strategic on what we're trying to do uh, to provide the space for students, and you know, ensuring that we're doing this. Uh, you know, being very um, conscious of what it's going to cost. You know, the plan is about you know four million dollars less than last year's. It is less than what we approve for the fire department for on an annual basis. So we know that you know, this, this could be digestible for the community, uh, but we all have to come together. So if you're looking for how to spread the word, reach out to us. We have plenty of places we can uh, use help from volunteers to get the word out, uh, from holding a sign to writing a letter um, of how you feel about this. So there's plenty of ways you can um, definitely help. So reach out and uh, thank you for support and just thank you for coming out for the democratic uh, process. Yeah, and just to mention also that tomorrow night we have another information session that begins at 6 o'clock uh, at the Central School. And again, that sort of uh, piggybacks up against uh, the 6.30 is the kindergarten parent information night. So it's a great opportunity if you have uh, a child that will start uh, kindergarten next year to come in and hear about the project. But also, you know, we will give you a personalized one-on-one -on -one individual tour. Re reach out to myself, reach out to Dr. Cheney. Uh, anyone who wants to see firsthand, when we've talked about safety and security, when we talked about special education, when we talked about student learning, uh, there, there are a lot of people. I am one of these people. I need to see it for myself. And if you're one of those people, just reach out. We'll set something up. You can come visit the school uh, since so you really get a sense. So you really are an informed voter uh, when you go uh, to cast that ballot on uh, March 14th here at the middle school from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Okay, uh, next up is, let's see, make sure I get this right, yep, we're bringing Nicole back up to discuss the 2023-2024 HSD uh, calendar, second reading, and adoption. Okay, in your packets, Melissa has... Um, included so thoughtfully a copy of the draft calendar as well as a copy of the Pinkerton approved calendar that was approved in January. Um, some of the things I wanted to highlight with this draft that we're proposing is that we still have early release days in place. However, not all of them line up with Pinkerton. We have several that I want to point out that will be half days like a full half day early release instead of the 80 minute early release that we're doing. Um, so we tried to get a few more of those in. Um, so the 27th of September lines up with Pinkerton as does the 25th of October, but then the November 6th and the December 22nd will be half days. Um, that December 22nd is the Friday before Christmas break and I think that is feedback we heard from our staff. So that, that'll be well received, I believe. February 7th, April 3rd, and May 15th all line up with Pinkerton, so those will be the 80-minute early release. Um, and the June 17th is a half day, the last day of school, the tentative last day of school. We've also moved the PD day in May to the Friday before Memorial Day. So hopefully that will help our families maybe, you know, enjoy the long holiday weekend a little bit longer. Um, and and it is not new, but we will have October 6th as a PD day as well. That is the Friday before the Columbus Day holiday. So we've tried to be strategic in our placement. Um, and our goal with the early release days, of course, is to get our staff uh, trainings that they need, time to collaborate, and professional development, professional learning is really you know, at the forefront to help us unroll new initiatives, learn about new technology programs. Next year we're gonna have a new ELA curriculum, so we're gonna need some training on that. 
um, and they need time to like work together to unpack some of these things. But I can answer any questions you have. I think the only one I have is I have, even though Aaron is not here in body and soul, I have her in my ear. We're all set with buses, correct? <laughs> <laughs> if I say yes to that, I get a knock on wood because <laughs> we've done very well with busing actually this year. But yes, the bus company is aware that um, we're going to be doing early release days again. Okay. I have no questions, board members. With, with, with some of the professional development, mm -hmm. Now that I'm in a different role, um, often it's a lot of giving them information, giving them information, but not letting them process through. Mm -hmm. um, is some of the like the longer PD days? Is, are you giving them the ability to work with what they've been given and integrate it? Or so that's interesting. Um, we are going to actually Jess and I and the principals are going to be meeting soon to start looking at our PD planning and professional learning planning for next year, given some of the uh, initiatives that we have happening. We really want to front load the calendar year with our learning. Um, but I think what we're going to probably be attempting to do next year is give them the information up front a little bit earlier so that they can have PLC time to unpack and process together. Okay. Um, but I would be remiss if I said that that's the case for all you know, all PD days. There will be some days that we have to deliver mandatory trainings. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. there's so many of them. So we, we're trying to be creative, but also balance that with professional learning. Have you gotten feedback from the teacher on how professional development has gone this year, like with surveys or anything like that? Um, anecdotally, yes, but we do do surveys in May for okay. the end of the year, and we'll focus some questioning certainly on PD and, you know, how it's gone. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Then uh, we're going to be looking for a motion to adopt the 2023-2024 HSD calendar. So moved. A second? second. Second. Second from Megan. Thank you. Any discussion? All approved? OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. All right, we get the fun one, financial audit update. Mr. Dowd? Financial audit or audit is um, in for the fiscal year 2020. Um, you'll find that report in front of you. The, the report has, still uh, has the governmental activities um, adverse opinion relating to the fixed assets. Uh, which are not in our books. And we had a very good discussion with, um, with our auditors and David and Jason, Bob and I um, conferenced with them. And one of the problems we have as a district is we, we're such an old district to try and get the cost of a lot of these assets is almost impossible. For example, central school cost is um, nowhere to be found in the, um, in the annual reports from the 40s. So they've, they actually offered a couple different ways to be able to get back to that, to be able to onboard all of our assets. Um, in a timely way and, and get them so that they are properly reflected. I don't know if it's going to make that much of a difference, but it's required to be there. So I am looking forward to a pathway out of that. We met today, um, and actually, Megan, you were there for policy. We spoke about updating the fixed asset policy on that call, and so policy committee has been looking at an update to that policy. It's similar to what um, I had put in place at, uh, at Timberlane with some amounts adjusted for um, more recent amounts on the fixed assets costs and that sort of thing. So the uh, report you have in front of you, that is still um, outstanding. The financial highlights you'll find on page five as part of management discussion and analysis show that we're a little bit higher on revenue than anticipated for that year. Uh, we contributed 400,000 um, into the capital reserve. The board authorized the two and a half percent maximum to be held as fund balance retention that year, which is 577,586. And the fund balance to reduce taxes for the 2021 year was $1,322,022. Uh, so I have another uh, series of other schedules that feel free to go through. I've, I've, I've included in the management discussion and analysis at the front of the audit 
um, an explanation of how some of those um, schedules work when we look at government-wide financial statements, fund financial statements, fund FUND, fund financial statements, and governmental funds. And uh, you'll, you'll see those throughout the audit. So I won't bore you. The uh, audit team did um, come in with a uh, notice of deficiency relating to our um, one of our grants. And I think it really supports the idea that um, that Hampstead is big enough. Hampstead does need its own support. Um, at the time that this uh, was occurring, we were still part of the Timberland School District. We have to work, uh, the finance group has to work with our grant owners and project managers. And at the time, we did not have an assistant director of special education. Our grants had been dispersed throughout a number of directors and principals in the district. Uh, it, was, it was a very um, untidy approach, which changed relatively quickly. And Bob came on board, thankfully, and since then we've actually been able to improve that process, the communication between finance and our uh, grant owners who are actually sitting in this room right now. So thank you, Nicole and Jessica, Tara Lynn. Um, we're, getting, uh, we're getting all of our uh, uh, billings to the state submitted uh, quite timely. We have a reconciliation process put in place and tracking process put in place initiated by the finance department which has proven to be very effective even among the um, grant uh, project owners. So definitely moving in the right direction there. Um, I included a response. I won't disagree, disagree with their recommendation um, to the extent that we had one, um, one grant that had not quite matched on our books compared to what we had uh, record, record, re reported and requested reimbursement from the state. And what had happened, we actually got the correct amount of money in from the state. And we just needed to make the adjusting entry on our books to make them uh, have them match um, it was an odd scenario i don't anticipate that's going to be happening again because we have much better contact between my our group finance and the grant owners project owners who submit the billings so i know you've had a chance to take a look at the report do you have any questions or comments i'd go through the report in detail but i don't know that anyone is suffering from insomnia in need of a cure because that's what it would be yeah, bob's already Get ready to doze off potentially. Um, a couple things I know that, and just for those uh, watching, we did have a really good meeting with the auditors that we set timelines on not only on this audit, but the next audit, next two audits. Uh, the next one should be done, I'd say, in the next month, two months. Mm -hmm. The following uh, 22, 23. Right, no, 21 22 be completed uh, by June, mm -hmm. and we'll kick off the 2022 2023 audit in the August time frame. So, probably a little more into the fall, but we may be able to start actually before the start, year ends with start in August, right? But we said start in August, not saying it's going to end in August, but yep. starts in August. Yep. So, we we're time, bo time bound in all these. Yep. So, uh, that was good. Um, I did have a question here about one of the findings on the policies where it says that noted that there are some that have not been formally reviewed or reaffirmed in a number of years do we have a list of those that they're recommending the ones that they're saying that we have not reviewed because I, I was under the impression we're on a pretty good review cycle of all our policies so do we have a listing of the ones that are outdated or is this something from prior and now we're up to date no this is something from prior i think that we probably still have a few that we're that are older in, in nature. I think one of them might be the fixed asset policy, um, for example. Um, we do have some others that we haven't taken a look at in a while. So as we go through, we have to obviously meet our statutory requirements. When a bill goes into effect, becomes a law, we need to make those changes to policy to reflect that new information, that, that new, um, new law. And after that, I think that, I don't know what the process has been for the policy committee in terms of trying to uh, prioritize policy updates is it based on time I mean obviously the first one is statute yeah absolutely it, it, we did a tremendous amount of work this summer um, taking our policy database and comparing it against the New Hampshire School Boards Association's recommended policy database and what we're able to do is identify which policies are out of date which policies don't we have uh, and create priorities and you'll certainly see that even tonight is a good example we prioritized, you know, uh, policies like suicide prevention and volunteers. We do have uh, 
policies that we plan to bring forward to the policy committee that are uh, in regards to um, finance. Uh, but right now have not recognized them as being a uh, priority compared to others that are linked to changes in statute. Okay. I guess we're looking at the recommendation and do we, do we, and probably don't have the answer tonight, but if we can get the answer, how many do we have that have not been reviewed in a three year period? Yeah, I can certainly uh, get that information. That, okay. That's not a problem at all. And so it may make some sense with those policies that really haven't had much change. Those are quick and easy to go through, look at right. the policy committee and just reaffirm. Right. You know, so it's, it's interesting you're trying to really attack the ones that need the attention, but Got in it. fact, it's the ones that are sort of the outliers that are quietly right. you know, doing just fine for us. We can go in and reaffirm rather quickly. Yep. Uh, we had, I think, five or six policies today. Yeah. None of which were reaffirmed, I don't believe. They were all some involve work. They do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when I was looking through the New Hampshire School Board database, there's some of the policies that haven't been updated in 15 years, but it's state, there's been no change in state laws. So it's entirely possible that while it looks like it hasn't been reviewed in a while, it may be just that there's been no changes in a while as well. I certainly wouldn't mind if the policy committee uh, put a priority on, yeah, on the new RSAs, on the ones that have been updated, and those that we can just reaffirm quickly, move on, review, talk about, discuss and get an updated date on them. Okay. Any other comments, questions about the findings? Now, have we had audits in previous years for when we were a part of Timberlane or? Sorry? Have we had audits in previous years when we were part of Timberlane? Yes. Or is there, are there any outstanding issues that came out of those audits that haven't been fixed yet or we haven't been able to look at? Policies? Just any, like in this one, there's, from what I saw in, from, from, my understanding is that there's very small issues that come out of this, yeah. but I didn't know if there's any big issues that had come up in previous audits that we, we had to tackle or take a look at. No, pretty much um, fixed assets, policies, um, and a few minor things that the procedurally at the schools and, and that sort of thing, essential school actually, and it's looking better than ever. We had had, um, we had had some, not findings, but things were mentioned that have been addressed, so they've okay. come, you know, they're no longer yeah. issues. I feel like anytime you're going to do an audit, they're going to come up with something because that's their job. So that is their I, job. I felt like there was a relatively minor issues that came up in this audit. So I thought that was a good sign. I think the two big ones are the fixed asset and the timeliness of our audits. You know, we're, as it's uh, mentioned in the audit that it did take a little bit longer, but we've addressed that through discussions and put time bound on the next audits. So I think those are the two big ones that we found over the last, you know, few cycles. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Dowd or Mr. Thompson? All right. And we'll say we'd probably have that update on the next audit for the next school board meeting, which is slated for the 28th of March. So we should have a good handle on the 2021. Yeah, we may, we may have it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Speaking of policies, uh, we've got uh, a number of policies for second reading. Um, I don't know if Megan, you wanted to give an overview of any of these for second reading or not. Policy committee. Um, so I think, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there were a couple new policies. Um, G, B, C, E. Um, which is training and information relative to sexual abuse prevention. Um, also, the suicide prevention and response. Um, I believe this one was new. Yep, this one was new as well. <laughs> and um, we took the sample policy from the NHSBA. Um, then I think the, the policies that were revised um, they were more minor, um, some definitions updated or added. Um, but no, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bob, no substantive um, updates to the existing policies. Uh, yeah, they were uh, relatively uh, minor, uh, the ones that were revised. I think the, um, the biggest um, 
impact here are the, the new policies um, that um, look to um, really kind of solidify some of the work we've been doing with suicide prevention. I'm very proud of the work that we're doing and uh, the partnership we have um, with NAMI. So that's reflected in a policy that, that was advocated by our counselors. Um, and then also um, the suicide, I'm sorry, the um, uh, information relative to child sexual abuse prevention is again a new statute this year uh, that increases the district's requirement to train to train staff I think for me you know in, in the unfortunate events that we talked briefly about earlier with JLDBB on the suicide prevention response I think my only ask there Ms. Thompson is that maybe in a, a bit of time not right now, but talk to Dr. Powers about what did they learn through yeah. what they've had to deal with, the unfortunate events, and if there's anything we can learn from that and apply here, you know, really hope that doesn't happen to us. The reality is we hear about it happen a lot, and if the, we can be more prepared, I think that'd be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, you know, in addition to the policy work, what, what the board uh, doesn't always see is, you know, we have... Uh, procedures, protocols, and practices in place. Right. And, and I'm, I've been very impressed with the work this year uh, that Jessica uh, Parsons has done as our Director of Student Services in working with her department to just build systems. And one of those systems uh, focuses on uh, suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. I just sat through a meeting yesterday where we talked about what, what is the school district's response to uh, a, a student who um, exhibits uh, risk of harm to self or others. Right. Like, how do we respond to that? Asking really good questions. Um, so again, to your point, you, you know, that it's such a tragic event. Uh, the best that we can do is just make sure that we have all the procedures we have in place to respond um, right. if, if that should happen. And absolutely, and I, I have reached out to Dr. Powers and will continue to do so as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, for the benefit of the public at home, would it be good to just go through the listing of, of, yep. of titles? Yep. So on the uh, policies that we have, that this is for second reading, um, we have IJOC for volunteers. Again, this is uh, around new language suggested to define what volunteers are, coaches, assistant coaches, and other volunteer responsibilities, termination implementation, and requirements to receive training relative to child abuse prevention. Then we also have GBEAB, which is the Mandatory Code of Conduct Reporting. This is for all employees. This new policy is not on the books today. Um, and it's about background investigations and criminal, criminal history records check. And we also have GBCE, which is the Training and Information Relative to Child Sexual Abuse Prevention. Again, this is a new policy not on the books. And then we have the one we were just speaking about, JLDBB, which is Suicide Prevention and Response. We also have IKL, Academic Integrity and Honesty, which is an optional policy that we didn't have on the books. And then lastly, we have IGE, Parental Objection to Specific Course Material. Uh, that was last revised in 2017, and we now have references to RSA 193-40. So those are the six policies. Any questions or comments before we go to a vote? So on the, the academic integrity and honesty one, it doesn't explicitly say use of uh, you know, AI, ChatGPT, but it does talk about writing services and violating the spirit of the policy. I just, for me, I, like I feel like as a board, the students should be producing their own work unless the teacher is giving them permission like to, to go ahead and do that. Um, like that's one of the reasons that I do, like I want this policy in place. Um, the other thing when it comes to suicide prevention is you can do everything right and it may not matter. Um, uh, do we have, do we do like the One Trusted Adult in Hampstead? Is that something we focus on? Yes, we do. Do we do anything with student voice where we, we ask the students, do they have somebody that's a one trusted adult or anything like that? 
Yeah, so you know, we, we have uh, a pretty comprehensive SEL curriculum uh, at both schools. Um, the mechanism uh, at the middle school that I'm very proud of is the work that they do in their ad advisory. Um, and so, you know, those, you know, the purpose of a robust advisory program is to build relationships with a, a one adult building relationship with a small group of students. How big so, yeah. and you know, relationships are always at the forefront. I see it every single day in every classroom I go into. And to your point, um, e even with building those trusted relationships, the, you know, these are tragedies that that you know can impact us. How, how big are our, our advisories? Uh, they're around uh, ten students. Okay. It really depends on the gr on the the grade level. Okay. Do do the students get choice in what they do with their advisories? Like who they have? Not always, but but often. Okay. Yeah. So if one of them wants to move, they could go to a guidance counselor and see about moving or something. Like that. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And, uh, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the six policies as stated. Sorry. Any more discussion? All approved. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, let's go board comments and correspondence. We'll start to my far left, Dr. Hubner. I would just like to say one of the reasons I came on this board is a member that will be leaving us after tonight, and I really appreciate all the being nice and the friendly face and all the help that you've given for me to be better a better member of the board. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Fantastic. Echo that. Thank you for everything. Um, I think the Hampstead School District is now in a better place than where it was three years ago, and you had a lot to do with that. So thank you for all the hard work. Thank you for everything you've done. You've been an amazing partner in all this. I was not expecting this. <laughs> 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 thank you, Jason. Um, I'm not going to say any of those things because I'm mad at you <laughs> for not being. No, um, no. I had a. a quick call with Megan a week ago or so and it was just uh, to thank her for the last three years definitely made it easier better being on the board making the good changes we've made in the good direction we're going you'll be sorely missed but we have kids in the same grade and around the same grade so we'll be watching <laughs> see you next year maybe so that's all I got all right well I did put something together yes. <laughs> Uh, just be a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say that the last time I was nervous at a school board meeting was the very first school board meeting. <laughs> um, but tonight I'm nervous. <laughs> um, so first I'll say that I feel so honored to have had this opportunity to serve the community in this manner on the board. Um, I joined the board back in March of 2020. <laughs> uh, and since the beginning, we have <laughs> all gotten through a lot together um, as a board, a district, and a community. Uh, just, after, uh, just after my term began, we were hit with COVID. And one of my most memorable voting experiences, and it was one of the first voting experiences was when we were presented with a safe learning plan. And at the time we were all remote and my last name was at the beginning. So I was the first to vote and I voted against the plan that was pre presented. And the whole time, the rest of the meeting, I was like, oh boy, like, what am I gonna hear from the board, the rest of the board tomorrow. And David, I thank you so much. I'm not even looking at this. <laughs> I thank you so much for all of your support. Um, we have not always agreed, and I think it's important for board members to not always agree, but I would say that we've always supported each other, I, and I appreciate that. Um, you've been like a mentor and um, just a great listener, um, you make a great chair. I look forward to listening on, on next, <laughs> next year's board meetings. 
Um, but you know, on top of the pandemic, uh, we were going through a separation with Timberlane. Uh, we were looking for a new superintendent. We um, brought on two new principals, um, a new vice principal. Uh, we completed teacher contract negotiations. We passed a 60s renovation wing uh, project. And in a couple weeks, we'll be hopefully passing um, a new renovation in addition. All to say that this has been like <laughs> Uh, a very eventful last three years. Um, I have been put outside of my comfort zone, uh, but it's really been very rewarding. Um, so I look back at my original intent to join the board, and um, I wrote something for myself before my term started. It was, um, I guess, maybe a goal or a mission. And I'm going to read it to you. And then, um, you know, it was a very emotional decision for me to um, decide whether I wanted to rerun or not. And I think the progress that we've made, that we have made um, towards my goal is um, what made me realize that uh, it's okay if I don't rerun. <laughs> um, so this is, this is the, um, what I had written to myself. I am running for school board uh, sorry, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> uh, to influence a transformation of how the school community looks at education. It's time we come together to empower our children to engage and embrace their relationships with the natural world. Nature is what connects us all to one another. It is our shared commonality that lies deep within our roots. Experience in nature promotes wonder and curiosity, creativity, co connectedness, and it supports the whole child socially, emotionally, and physically, which are all necessities for our youth to grow and thrive in the world that has become disconnected, or as Dr. Cheney said earlier, um, digitalized. The natural world serves as a teacher of lessons that benefit our children far beyond the classroom walls. It is my goal to reconnect our children with nature. From the very beginning, I have been talking about outdoor learning. Um, I have been talking about outdoor learning to anyone I can get a hold of. Um, building principles, past and present, uh, district administration, teachers, fellow board members. And I'll say it was very frustrating at times because um, what seemed like very obvious opportunities for us to get our children um, outside, I felt like uh, no one was really, no one else saw it or no one was listening. Um, but it was not until Bob and Nicole came on board that I understood why the timing may have not been right prior to welcome, welcoming them to Hampstead. Bob and Nicole have been so enthusiastic and open to exploring ways to bring classroom learning outside of the confines of the buildings. And it really helps that they both have had experience in prior districts, um, implementing a variety of different flavors of outdoor learning. Um, so it did not take a lot of convincing on my part to help them see, um, they could already see, why nature provides uh, these invaluable opportunities for our students. When you have leadership that shows passion and motivation for change, it makes change uh, maybe not seamless but easier to accept. And you know, earlier with Nicole explaining about the Summer Learning Academy, uh, so, you know, the work that we're doing with the community garden, Field to Fork Farm, our partnership with UNH. Um, I think about the New Hampshire Astronom uh, Astronomical Society. And I've talked to uh, students that I know personally that go outside uh, in the middle school. They go outside during reading and they are asked to think about alliteration and what figurative language means to them. Um, there's just so many simple ways to um, get our kids outside and I, I do think that Bob and Nicole have a lot uh, to do with that. Um, I don't even know where I am. Uh, okay, the word is spreading, teachers are getting excited. And yes, Bob and Nicole. <laughs> 
Uh, for the past two years, outdoor learning and community-based learning has been board goal uh, that we have seen good momentum on. And we have a strategic plan that encompasses a goal of flexible learning opportunities for our students, which includes utilizing outdoor spaces. And while the work is not final, I do feel that a solid foundation has been built. And while I may not be a part of the board, the new board next year, I will certainly not lose sight of all the opportunities I continue to talk to, I can talk to all of you um, about getting our kids outside. Uh, my hope is that we continue to keep uh, nature close to mind and heart as a way to reconnect our students with themselves and one another, supporting themselves as a whole, uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> we're going to move to the consent agenda, but thank you, Megan. Um, so, Mr. Thompson, uh, you want to yeah. start it So, uh, under the consent agenda, uh, there is no personnel report this evening. Uh, so, moving on to superintendent's report, uh, I just want to start by extending uh, my condolences uh, to the Pinkton Academy uh, community. Um, as uh, Shannon had indicated earlier in her report, um, there was a uh, sudden and tragic loss of uh, a student uh, last week and uh, I thought it would just be fitting for me to just to read a portion of um, the communication that Dr. Powers sent to Pinkerton, the Pinkerton community. This is Dear Pinkerton Academy community. <sighs> Hold on, sorry. <laughs> we are deeply saddened uh, to share that one of our students, Ezra Alvarez, passed away on Tuesday, February 14th. Ezra was a member of the junior class <clears throat> a football player and a well-liked member of our community. He was a truly special person, talented and hardworking, and will be greatly missed by many people uh, he touched in his life. So I've had the opportunity to uh, reach out to Dr. Powers uh, on behalf of the Hampstead community and extend our condolences uh, to uh, not only the family of uh, Ezra, but all of the, uh, the Pinkerton Academy uh, community and family. Uh, so moving on, um, we have uh, some snow in the forecast, and uh, so we're keeping an eye on Thursday. Um, if uh, snow prohibits us from having um, on-site school, we'll have a remote day. That would be my hope to uh, make a decision tomorrow late afternoon or, or early evening. I know our teachers are very busy making sure that um, Zoom is working and Chromebooks are working and all that good stuff. So I, I just want to say I really appreciate the efforts of our building administration and our teachers. Um, there's a lot of orchestration and work that goes on in planning a remote day. Maybe we won't need it, but I don't know. We'll, we will find out. Um, I also just wanted to um, mention that our positions for next year are on our website. They are on EdJobs NH. Um, they're also on SchoolSpring. We have a number of positions uh, available, both uh, currently, but also for the next school year as well. This is a tremendous uh, place to work. Um, so I would just ask if, uh, if people are listening and want to give some thought to working in a school or you're working in another district, uh, we'd love to uh, have you join our team. We would encourage you to um, apply for an open position. I also just wanted to add too that, uh, you know, last week we celebrated the 100th day of school. And uh, we celebrated that by um, getting our, uh, our principals and district admin together to um, review the strategic plan. And uh, I say celebration uh, with great intent uh, because as the board is aware, not only do we have a three-year strategic plan, but we have uh, an action plan for each of those three years. Uh, we were able to sit down the, uh, and have a discussion about the progress we've made towards the strategic plan. And I have to just tell you how impressed I am with the work that's going on in the buildings. And, and most of this stuff has been talked about. So, you know, but, uh, you know, Dr. Cheney was talking about instructional rounds. You know, we have teachers going into other teachers' classrooms to observe their practice, to have conversations about uh, their practice and the things that they're seeing. Uh, you know, we have uh, Nicole and Jessica working on a brand new staff evaluation model that looks more like a coaching model that provides teachers with real-time uh, feedback on their performance. 
Uh, we are creating uh, an inventory of our curriculum uh, programs. Uh, we're creating uh, cross grade level opportunities for, for students to meet. Uh, we've implemented the One Trusted Adult uh, pro program at uh, the middle school. We have a new uh, website that's about to be deployed. Uh, we have scheduling task force in both buildings and we have completed a comprehensive facility study. I look at the work that this team has done and our teachers have done in the half a year, a hundred days of school. To me, that's the work that would normally be done in three years we've done in a hundred days of school. I'm very proud of the people in this organization. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say thank you, Megan. Um, speaking of the strategic plan, I, um, I really appreciate the push. And I mean, you know, you, um, from the first time we met, really went out of your way to share your passion. You exude it uh, for outdoor learning. And it just so nicely fit with a lot of the philosophies that uh, both Nicole and I have shared and have shared for years. And I, I sort of dedicate um, priority five of the strategic plan is like your priority, right? And that is to design learning environments to match our educational philosophies. And when I look at that, that has you uh, in everything that you believe and all the passion you brought to the table. Um, you know, this school district is a better place uh, because of the work that you have done as a advocate for the children in your role as a board member. I greatly appreciate that. I'm not going to say goodbye because we are definitely not letting you off the hook. Um, you will continue to serve a very valuable role just in a different capacity. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, that's all I have for my report. I'll entertain any questions that board members might have at this time. No. Any? All right, then uh, I do not believe we have any other business, old business, and we don't have a non-public, so we will adjourn. Ah, before you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, had to ruin it. I had to ruin it. It should be quick, though. It's a formality. Don't know exactly why it's done, but it occurred to me that you didn't take a, a, a vote or accept a motion to accept the audit report. Does it really matter? You've reviewed it. You've talked about it, but yep. it's, it's, it's a, a slight formality. Point. Yep, slight formality. So I will make a motion to accept the audit report for 2020 to 2021. Any discussion? All right, all approved. All right, then uh, thank you for that, Mr. Dowd. And with that, we will adjourn at 8.33, 12 minutes early market. Thank you, Melissa.